Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, um, Thursday, September the 1st. Uh, this is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room's open. I did pop the link into there, what we're talking about. Robert uh, Robert Bernie's webpage is from Joy to You and Me, or Joy to Me and You, and that's J-O-Y-W-W-W-J-O-Y, the number 2, M-E-U.com. And that's what we've been looking at for about three months now, looking at uh, inner child healing work and codependency and boundaries and all kinds of stuff like that. And he's got some great information there. and Hopefully you're all getting something out of this. I know I am. You have to you have to listen at your own discretion. I'm not a counselor or a therapist. You know, I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows here on Blog Talk Radio. And this is really my healing journey. And I'm just hoping that somewhere in there, somewhere in the process, you know, that, that people will get something out of this. And just, you know, I find the information very helpful for myself, so... Um, yeah, so you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows. I'm talking about abuse, and abuse is a sensitive subject. If you're a survivor, you're just starting your healing journey. You want to be careful what you're listening to because it can trigger you, you know. And you have to know that you're not going to hurt yourself or that you're going to, you know, that, that you're able to do um, and listen to this kind of stuff because you don't want to hurt yourself or regress backwards in your healing journey. And other people, you have to listen at your own discretion. You don't know what's good for you to listen to. And people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have someone listen to the show with you who can help you. You know, decide whether or not you should be listening to to this show or to any of my shows because there is adult content on my shows. I just believe in protecting children at all times, so make sure you do that and have permission to listen to my show. And um, so you know, we get right into this. this. We're looking at a codependent relationship dynamics, codependent and counter counter dependent behavior. And this is from Robert Bernie. Robert Bernie is a codependence therapist. He's a grief counselor. He's a He's an author. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's done a whole lot of writing. He wrote a book called Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls. And he has a website that uh, www.joy, J-O-Y, the number 2, M-E-U dot com, which is just loaded with stuff. If you go to the site index, you can see how much he's written. He's actually written a whole lot of stuff here. And uh, there's just about everything here. <laughs> so you can take a look and see if there's something there that you know you might want to read into. I think... He's also he's a spiritual teacher, and you know he's he's looking at the whole the, the whole picture of societal, you know, dysfunctional uh, belief systems and attitudes and behaviors within society, as well as individual you know individual behavioral issues. So it's really quite interesting to see what he has to say, and I'm I'm getting a whole lot out of it. Some of it's a little bit over my head, but for the most part, I can see what he's saying, and some of it I agree with, some of it I don't. But he's got a Codependent Relationships Dynamics Part 3, Codependent and Counterdependent Behavior. And I really want to take a look at this cause, because he says here, um, I'll just read right where he says what it really is. Um, like codependence is, he says, some of us, classic codependent behavior, tried to control through people pleasing, being a chameleon, wearing a mask, dancing to other people's tunes. And some of us, classic counterdependent behavior, protected ourselves tried to be in control by pretending that we didn't need other people. So either way, we are living life in reaction to our childhood wounds and we're not making clear con- conscious choices. So the codependent be- you know, person would be living their life through trying to control other people or trying to please other people or trying to be wearing a different mask, you know, playing a playing a chameleon, dancing to other people's tunes and counter dependent people would be saying, Oh, I don't need anybody right and so either way, it's very dysfunctional. And I know, like, that's what I was talking about yesterday. Like, I'm more, I think, counter-dependent than anything. But I'm still, you know, I'm better than I used to be, for sure. But um, I know when I was young, I I, I definitely was like that. had a, ba- a bad attitude. And most people would say it was a bad attitude. It was. But it was a protective measure. And you know, <clears throat> trying to kind of, I guess over the years, you know, I learned that through working and, and building these work relationships and other types of relationships outside of my home and family, that I, I could actually let people into my life and I actually could maintain relationships, right? But I know before I was about, before I hit 20, you know, 25 years old, I was just learning how to do that because my whole life I had been sort of, because I had been abused as a child, so I was just like, well, if all everybody's going to do is hurt me, then I don't really need them anyway. So it was just a way so that, so I wouldn't feel like I was getting hurt again just by the rejection that I was feeling in the, you know, that whole thing is sort of like, you're going to reject me, I'll just reject everybody, you know. It's like, and then and it just made me feel better because it was like, well, I don't need them anyway, so it doesn't matter if they hurt me or not. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's dysfunctional for sure. 
And so he says, um, attempts to control are a reaction to fear. So he says, it is what we do to, to try to protect ourselves emotionally. Some of us try to control people through pleasing, like you said before, being a chameleon, wearing a mask, etc. So either way, we're living life in reaction to childhood wounds. And he says, both classic codependent and class and counterdependent behaviors are part of the condition disease of codependency in my definition. And he says there are just two different extremes in the spectrum of behavioral defense systems that the ego adapts in early childhood. And the, these are just two different extremes, right? He says the ways in which we got hurt the most in childhood felt to our ego like a threat to survival, and it built up defenses to protect us. <clears throat> so he says both... Um, he says both the classic counterdependent and codependent patterns are reactive codependent traits that are out of balance and dysfunctional. So he says we do need other people, but to allow our self worth to be determined in reaction to other people is giving power away and setting ourselves up to be victims. So it is very important to own that we have worth as the unique special being that each of us is, not dependent on how other people react to us. And he says, this is a very difficult process for those of us who have classic codependent patterns of trying very hard to get other people to like us, of feeling that we are defined by how others think of us, treat us, of being people pleasers and martyrs. And classic codependent behavior involves focusing completely on the other. When a codependent dies, someone else's life passes in review. Someone else's life passes in review, having no self self except as defined in relationship to the other. So this is dishonest and dysfunctional. It sets up it sets us up to be the victims be victims and causes one to not only be unable to get one's needs met, but to not even be aware that it is right to have needs. And so yeah, codependency is a bad news thing and I think most people are codependent, I really do. Like most people are trying to get their needs met through other people. And I, I see this I mean, just about everybody they've ever met in my lifetime, I've seen some of it, you know what I mean? And I think it's just, it's because it's societal. And like Robert Brady's pretty well right on that, you know, speaking it like it is. Um, so many people have these issues and wouldn't even know what it is. That's why when I heard about codependency, I was like, man, i got to learn more about this because I think that, you know, I very well could be codependent or could have these traits and that's really going to drive my behavior issues, you know, and if I don't even know what it is, then how am I going to correct it? You know, and that's so we're trying to live our lives through somebody else, right? And it's all our whole lives would be defined defined by how other other people think of us and how other people treat us, and we'd be trying to always please somebody else and never never getting our own needs met. And there's all kinds of my mother was exactly like that, and she was. It's not like she was trying to please anybody in the home because she was very abusive to all of us. But the thing is, is she. She would say that she was. She was always, look at what I do for you. And I get no respect and I get nothing back. You know what I mean? And she was a big time martyr. You know what I mean? Like my, There was all kinds of, of issues that she had. and You know, it, it's bizarre. You know what I mean? It's absolutely bizarre. And I know that my sister's like that. She very much doesn't have a life of her own. She just lives it through other people. And, you know, she can't just be her own person. She has to base everything on how other people see her. And so she, when you're talking to her, you never ever even get a truthful answer, and you never get any kind of truth from her at all because she's only saying what she thinks that you want to hear. And so it's no good to have a conversation with her because she's only going to say what she thinks that you want to hear, right? Until she gets, once in a while she'll throw a fit and get angry and 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 you know, sort of throw her own opinion out there. But normally she doesn't have an opinion, you know, because she has an opinion only based on. So what what somebody else, how how somebody would think of her what they would think of her by by stating that she even has an opinion or that she has needs or wants or desires so she's very much a, she's a total codependent person <clears throat> you know and that's a horrible way to be because she just doesn't even know who she is you know and she just defines herself by what other people would think you know well if I say this what are people going to think or if I do this what are people going to think and you know. People pleasing. She's very much a people pleaser. She'll kill herself to do something for somebody. But and it's not because she wants to do what she's doing. She just does it because she wants them. She that's how she lives her life. So she doesn't get any self gratification unless unless she has she thinks that people are are pleased with what she's doing, even if she she shouldn't be doing it because it's too much. You know what I mean? So she'll she'll kill herself to do things for certain people, and um, 
you know, throw herself completely, you know, out of, uh, you know, physical whack, you know, just physically run down and everything else. But she'll do it because she wants to gain, she's looking for that attention and that love through that. And that's, that's you know, all the people pleasers, right? I've never been a people pleaser, actually. <laughs> that's why I, maybe I don't have a lot of friends, you know what I mean? Because I... You know, I mean, I don't know. It's uh, I guess being the last born, the last year born, you know, people would say, well, did other people do things for you? Well, no, I was kind of forced to do things on my own because nobody was really doing much for me. Like, you know what I mean? As far as like nobody was like, I didn't have siblings that were crowding around me to do things for me. You know what I mean? And I, I sort of had to just do it on my own. But I think that's where, that's exactly what happened to me. And that's why I'm kind of more counter dependent than anything. It's kind of like, oh, I don't need you guys, you know. You're useless and worthless anyway, and you haven't done anything for me, so you know I'll just buzz off who needs you anyway. So that was my attitude, and so basically what it was, I learned how to do for myself and not for others, and so you know I, I sort of have to work at doing things for other people, and people would say, oh that's not true, you know, I mean you do you do stuff for other people, I do, but it's very limited, and you know and I and 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 it's just because I know what I the energy levels that I have, you know what I mean. A lot of times I just don't have the energy levels that it would take to do certain things for people and I just you know I just don't because of that you know and I think some people might think it's selfishness but actually it's just because I'm freaking tired you know I was like born um, premature and I was born sick right and so I never really was all that healthy and then I have never did take care of myself my parents weren't taking care of me and so you know it, it's been a hard drive the only time I actually really felt half decent was when I was about 20, 20 22 years old and that's just because I was working out, but I was still, you know, I had got, gotten off the drugs, but I was still um, not in that great of shape. But that was the best shape I've been in ever, and so it's been a, a sort of downhill from there. <laughs> and I just, you know, as an adult, don't look after myself that well. And so I just don't have the energy levels that a lot of people may have uh, to go out and try to people please. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I, I, I like to do things for people. But I don't base my life on it, and I'm not really trying to gain brownie points. Some people think that I do. And actually, I've done that with bosses before bosses for some reason uh and that all comes back to my mother trying to please my mother that i did actually bend over backwards to try to please her and so anytime i have a boss i will pretty well do just about anything i can to gain that boss's um, love or trust or whatever and i've been called a brown nose for it and things like this and actually what it is is it's just that um i know what i've been in managerial positions before and lower management and so I know what, how hard it is to be a manager. So I always quite, I always quite often do support the manager um, and take the manager's side on a lot of stuff if I think they're right. And so then it kind of comes across as, uh, as people pleaser. But actually, they or she's just a boss, you know, ass kisser or whatever. But that's not necessarily true because they're not looking at the whole picture. Um, you know, I think there's so many times people judge without even thinking about, you know, what's going on with that person or why they would do something. So many people just like to judge anyway, and we, you know, and I don't really care what people think because I don't live my life based on what I th- other people think. I really don't, and so I really don't care what anybody thinks. Period. Right? I'm living my life, and whether people like it or not is just really doesn't really matter to me. Um, it's great to have support, and I love to have people in my life who do are interested in what I'm doing. But I, I don't base my life on, based on what other people are thinking or. You know, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this because you know somebody might think that, wonder why I'm doing this, or they might question it, or they might think it's silly, or you know, I'm like, oh, whatever. You know, I got a life to live, and I really don't have time for that kind of stuff. So I don't, you know, have too much of the codependent stuff. About you know, probably have a little bit of those traits, and also some of the counterdependent. You know what I mean? Because it's what he says. Robert Bernie says you can switch between both codependent and counterdependent behaviors, even within the same relationship, right? So you can sort of switch them around. And I know I've done that many times. <laughs> I've used bits and pieces of that my whole life, you know what I mean? And I think most people do. I, I haven't met anybody yet. They're really, to be honest with you, I don't think I've met anybody yet who hasn't had some of this or, or done some of this or, or sort of displayed some of these behaviors, right? So he says... Um, yeah, yeah, he says it sets us up to be victims, causes one to not only be unable to get one's needs met, but to not even be aware that it is right to have needs, right? And that's not good, right? A classically codependent person, when asked about themselves, will will reply by talking about the other. Obviously, before someone with this type of behavior, behavioral defense can experience any self-growth, they have to first start opening up to the idea that they have a self. 
So the process of owning self is frustrating and confusing. And the concept of having boundaries is foreign and bewildering. It is an ongoing process that takes years. And as it unfolds in stages, and there's always another level of the onion to peel. So <laughs> Robert Bray, he writes, sometimes he writes some pretty comical stuff. He says, so for someone whose primary pattern is classically codependent, the next level of growth will always involve owning self on some deeper level. So a very important part of this process is owning the right to be angry with the others, with with the way others' behavior has impacted our lives, starting in childhood. Yeah, that's right. See, that's where my sister, she just, she's in denial. She's in denial about everything. Because if she actually accepts what happened to us as a child, and her as a child, her specifically, let's just say, not even just the family, but but her, you know, and starts to accept what happened in our family and what it did to her personally, then she'll have to remember and she'll have to, it'll be painful. And she doesn't, and, and this is a, a protection measure. You know, to just you know to just be in denial, and that way she doesn't have to feel anything about it, and she can just remember some of the good things that happen, which are very few and far between. But you know, she remembers some of the good things, and she's she just keeps it at that. In this way, she doesn't have to feel hurt. She doesn't have to feel, you know, anything really. And um, it's just it, she doesn't really ever express her real feelings on anything because she won't allow herself to see them because it's painful and it hurts. So there's only on one. There's only a couple of small levels of honesty that you're gonna ever get from from her, and you know, like on a day-to-day basis, like talking to her is kind of like, you know, you can only really talk about shopping, or you can only really talk about the movie that you saw the other day because she, that's all she's that's all she's gonna give you. You know what I mean? And so you never get an honest conversation out of her, and it's kind of a drag. You know what I mean? Because it's too. My other sister was like that too. So both of my sisters were like that. And, um, you know, it's just kind of like, well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, if you want to be in denial, that's fine. My, my one sister wasn't in denial, the one that passed away from cancer. She she was just so angry about what happened to her that she was like, I, I don't want to hear another flipping word about anything. You know, like nobody's talking about nothing. Like whenever we came around, I'd go to her house or whatever and, and have coffee or dinner or something. She'd be like, none of you people are talking about anything except for the weather, you know, um, how good the coffee is, that kind of thing, because because our family couldn't even be in the same room together without a fight breaking out, right? So that was the problem. So my oldest sister was just like, nobody's talking about nothing. She controlled everything. And she did that with her own family, too. She controlled every single aspect of their lives. And even her adult sons, like, she controlled their lives, too. Her, she had two sons, and one died, actually. One got killed in a by a drunk driver um, quite a few years ago. He was, he was just uh, three months younger than me. And he was, um, so he was 25 years old and I was 25. And, you know, my other nephew was married like, I don't know, three, four times, right? And, you know, she controlled their lives all all the time. Like, she had to control the kind of furniture he had in his house. In his house. Not, not let alone the kind of furniture she has in her house. She was controlling the kind of furniture that her son had in his house. She she controlled every single aspect of her of her and her husband's and her children's life, my sister. And that was because the life growing up in the home that we grew up in was so chaotic. It was so absolutely crazy that when she got older, she thought, no way, I'm having total control. And this way, I get to say what goes. No one gets hurt unless I say they do. And so she was very abusive. And um, and this way, she she wouldn't get hurt again, but it wouldn't matter who else got hurt in the process. She was going to make sure she didn't get hurt again, you know. And so we all did some of that, you know what I mean? Like all of my siblings did some of that. And this is from growing up with two very ignorant, hurtful, hurtful people. And so what are you going to do? So he says, um, classic uh, classic counterdependent behavior focuses completely on the self and builds huge walls to keep others out. It is hard for those of us who exhibit classically counterdependent behavior patterns to even consider that we may be codependent. We have lived our lives trying to prove that we don't need others, that we are independent and strong, and the counterdependence is the other extreme of the spectrum. If our behavior patterns have been primarily counterdependent, it means that we are we were wounded so badly in childhood that in order to survive we had to convince ourselves that we don't need other people, that it is never safe to get close to other people. And so each of us has our own spectrum of behavioral defenses to protect us from being hurt emotionally. And we can be count, or codependent in one relationship and counterdependent in another, or we can swing from co to counter within the same relationship. So that's what Robert was saying before. 
Because often someone who is primarily counter-dependent will get involved with someone who is even more counter-dependent and then will act out of the codependent role in that particular relationship. And the same can happen with two people with primar- primarily codependent patterns. That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> you know, like, like my sweetheart even today, like I don't talk too much about him, but he's totally counter-dependent. He, does, he doesn't he does need anybody. He's just got this attitude. He's a, he's a one-man show, you know. And life is just revolves around his, his one-man show. And the only reason why we actually were able to even have a relationship is because the two of us realized that we didn't need anybody and we thought, okay, we're the same type of people. We're counter-dependent, so we're safe in that area, right? <laughs> we don't even need each other, so we'll hang out together. It was totally safe. It was like, okay, you admit that you don't need me. I admit that I don't need you. We can walk out of this relationship at any time. And that's the only reason why it worked for him, and that's the only reason why it worked for me. You know what I mean? And that's why we're together. The two of us, I, I seriously think, I don't know if we if we could even have a different, if anybody would be able to tolerate the two of us. I, I seriously doubt it because, you know, it's like we were just made for each other, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and so, but, you know, actually, this is so true because what happens then is one will act as out the codependent role in that particular relationship. And actually, we both do it sometimes, right? Sometimes both of us will take on the attitude of trying to get our needs met through the other person and trying to trying to base all of our stuff on what the other person is doing and trying to kind of control the situation by running the other person's day or run, you know trying to figure out what the other person should be doing instead of just leaving the other person alone because both of us are counter dependent so both of us don't take well to each other trying to butt in on each other's stuff and so it only works when we're not butting in on each other's stuff. But the minute we start trying to do that, then there's a breakdown in the relationship and then we have issues trying to get it back together. But it's just a very serious thing for most people. I think that, you know, it's hard. It's absolutely hard. But see, I recognize that about him and there was just something, he recognized that about me. And so we just, we actually hit it off. Whereas most people, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I'm sure there's lots of people like that, counter-dependents, you know, looking for other counter-dependents to hang out with because it's safe. You know, it's like, okay, you don't need me, I don't need you, we're safe, right? And so, you know, <laughs> that's the truth of it right there. And actually, that's where I'm comfortable. That's why, that's the only reason why I can be in this relationship is because I need to be free to live my life. You know what I mean? I really don't need somebody trying to control what I'm doing. I don't need anybody trying to tell me what to do throughout the day. I don't need another mother. I didn't have one in the first place. I don't need one now. Um, I don't need someone trying to manipulate my choices, my decisions. My decisions and my choices are mine and mine alone to make. And um, we don't have any kids in the situation, so it's perfect, right? It's just me and him. And he does his thing. I do mine. You know, I try to stay out of his hair and stay out of his business. Like, he does what he wants, you know what I mean? And we don't, we don't put that kind of pressure that a lot of people would put on each other in a relationship. You know, like, well, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And see, that'd be okay if I hadn't been so severely abused as a child, right? But for me, I have to have control over what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Because I can no longer tolerate anybody just setting me up for another fall. And so, you know, he realized that, you know, because I told him about my past and stuff many years ago. And, and you know, he, he learned very quickly that it was, you know, I was having severe problems with the abuse that I suffered just from the nightmares that I was having and some of the behavioral issues that I was having and... You know, I was in my 30s when I met him, and, and and he was, you know, he was well aware of it, and he was like, well, you know, he says, and he he's the same kind of person as me, but he had a good upbringing. His parents were were loving towards him, and so he doesn't understand, you know, how people could do these things to children, and, you know, but he he's still very much counter dependent, right? And um, so the two of us, it only works when he's not trying to control me, because I can't be controlled by anybody, right? Like, I will not allow anybody to control what I do during the day or what I do at night. I won't allow anybody to control what I plan on doing for my future. Um, You know, I'm really kind of like a solo person, right? It's kind of like, no, I'm going to live this journey out. I'm going to do it exactly the way that I want to. If there happens to be people along for the ride, that's great. If not, that's fine too, right? Everybody has a journey to make. Everybody's got a life to live. And I just can't go living my life for somebody else. You know what I mean? But in this other hand, on the other hand, my sweetheart's terminal ill. He was diagnosed terminal ill uh, 11 years ago, and I mean, you know, we've of course I care about him. We, you know what I mean? Of course I'm, you know, he thought for sure I should just leave the relationship. He's like, well, I'm terminal ill now, you know, and I'm I'm just going to die, and you know, you should go on and find someone else. And I'm just like, well, why 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 would I want to do that? 
even though we don't need each other, quote unquote, <laughs> I still love him. You know what I mean? And he's, he still loves me. So basically what it is, we just don't put pressure on each other in the relationship. He's allowed to come and go. He just, he does his thing. I don't question what he's doing. I totally trust what he's doing because I know that he's not out even when he was younger and in good shape and not, not terminally ill, but you know, he was, he was, he's been sick for many years, but didn't know it until 11 years ago. And I mean, you know, I told him, I said, you you, you want to go and, and meet some other woman or whatever. You don't do that behind my back. Come and tell me. And then we can split off the relationship. I said, you just don't screw me around because I won't do that to you. And we made a deal that we wouldn't hurt each other. And, and like, we've done really well, I think, the two of us in this counter-dependent relationship. You know what I mean? So, you know, he does care about me. He does all kinds of nice things for me in this counter-dependent relationship. It's just that our belief systems is is based on the fact that we need to very much be our own person. You know what I mean? For for whatever reason, you know what I mean? Like, we need to be able to make our choices and make our decisions <clears throat> and feel that we're in control of those. You know what I mean? So I don't control his. He doesn't control mine, and it works. The minute he starts trying to control what I'm doing during the day or trying to control my life, I'm like, you know what, buddy? Back right off. This is not the way our relationship works. And um, when I do that to him, he tells me, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not putting up with that. So we we have to sometimes you know those boundaries are pretty set you know so so if we cross those boundaries we're we're pretty well told okay that's it you have to back up because you know we've already set these boundaries in place and this is how it works and it doesn't work any other way and so you know they, for for some people this is just the way that it is right and um and, and I'm and I'm comfortable in this situation so that's fine but not everybody would be but but that's the only way I can be comfortable. You know, and I just, you know, from from witnessing violence and, and being abused for so many years, I just can't be involved in that anymore. And I and I really have to have my own direction, my own clear direction, and my own clear, uh, you know, choices to make. And they are mine to make. And some stuff we have to decide on together. You know what I mean? But but that's just normal living stuff. But I'm just talking about. You know, he doesn't control what I'm what I'm thinking. He doesn't control what I'm going to do in the next two years. He doesn't control, you know, how much time I spend online. He doesn't control anything. You know what I mean? And sometimes he says, "Well, you know, I wish you would spend more time with me." And you know, he says, "I'm, you know, because I'm dying." And you know, we and we we don't spend much time together, even though we're now we're living together. We're still very much separate people. And I told him, I said, "You know what? That's true." I can take a few nights off during the week to suspend with you, you know, because we eat dinner together. We figure that's good enough, right? Well, we're counter-dependent. We don't really need each other, right? And so, um, you know, we enjoy each other's company, even though we're counter-dependent. That's why it works for both of us. We do, we do love each other, so there's no issue there. Um, and I, you know, so sometimes he you know, when, he, when he's not getting his needs met, he will tell me. And when I'm not getting my needs met, I tell him, you know, I tell him I need a hug. I really do. I mean, today I need a hug, you know. And, um, you know, otherwise, you know, we do pretty good just doing our own thing, giving each other that space that we both need, and it, it totally works. But not everybody would be able to deal with that. Um, so he says both the classic codependent patterns and classic counterdependent patterns are behavioral defenses, strategies designed to protect us from being abandoned. So one tries to protect against abandonment by avoiding conf- confrontation and pleasing the other, while the second tries to avoid abandonment by pretending we don't need anyone else and both are dysfunctional and dishonest so that's the end of that article but it is very interesting and i just want to take a look at it because i had seen it and i briefly saw a couple pieces about it and i thought wow that's something i really want to look into because i know that i sort of recognize some of that stuff within myself and so hopefully getting something out of this tomorrow we're going to look at there there was more if you go to the site index you can see there's a whole section on inner child healing um and on codependency relationship stuff right he's got these sections all laid out and mapped out for the on his site index, right? So I did find a few things that we didn't go through on the on the um, inner child healing work. And I looked through them and I thought, no, we didn't go through that. Some of it was pretty lengthy and I don't remember doing that. So I'm actually going to go back and, and finish that stuff. So I'm going to start that tomorrow because there is a whole lot more to that than just than what we read. There's probably about two or three more pages left of that. So thanks, everybody, for being here. You know, I appreciate everybody's tuning in live and tuning in archive, you know, and taking the time to listen to what I have to say. And I hope that what I'm I hope my journey will help somebody else to realize that they do deserve to have a good life and that, you know, to be good to themselves and to stick around and to get some help and, you know, whatever they have to do, whether it's self-help or reaching out to a counselor, therapist, reaching out to people around you, whoever, you know, whatever way it works for you, right? Because everybody's different, right? We all have different needs and what works for me may not work for you. What, you know, what works for you may not work for me. 
But it's just a matter of finding what works, you know what I mean? And and then allowing yourself to do it, right? Because we certainly do deserve to be, we deserve to have a good life. My God, we were abused as children. If you were abused as a child, man, you, you know, you certainly deserve so much better. And right now as an adult, the only person that can do that for myself is me. And so that's why I realized, hey, it was going to have to be me to do this job. I was like, wow, okay. Um, You know, so four and a half years ago, I started my healing journey. And so, you know, I just hope that people will stick around, stick it out. There's hard days. There's dark days. It's hard, right? It doesn't mean it's easy, but you can do it. And there's other people in front of me saying, come on, you can do this. So I know, you know, I know it's possible. So take good care of yourselves, everybody. I'll be gone tomorrow morning. One child to be a survivor to another same time, same place. And we'll just pick up on some of that other inner child work. So, have a great day, everybody. If I can get something for you, let me know. I'll be around on Facebook or wherever, and you can just leave me a message here on Blog Talk Radio if you need to get a hold of me. Take good care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.